This is chapter 10. We're still talking about the cardiovascular system. Um, looking at blood pressure, etc. Uh, when there are imbalances in the blood pressure, either too high or too low, there's going to be uh, potential issues long term that can happen from this. Obviously, there's going to be short changes uh, in blood pressure depending on what you're doing. Typically, it's going to be lower when you're lying down, and if you change to a standing or sitting position, that's going to have a slight change in the blood pressure. It's going to increase. Typically, if you start exercising, it should go up. If you're upset, if you have a fever, some of these things will cause, uh, like I say, a short-term change in the blood pressure. Age, sex, weight, your mood, the race, the posture, that can cause variation in blood pressure in that individual. Hypertension is high blood pressure, and we use this term to des describe when the pressure is sustained at 140 over 90. Prehypertension is that the values, they're higher, like say they normal is considered around 120 over 80. Lately, they start to decrease that to 110 over 70. So prehypertension is if it's above that, but it's not to 140 over 90 yet. Um, it may be slightly high due to uh, if you have an infection, if you're upset about something. Uh, people who are overweight, it tends to be a persistent thing. It's not just over oh, two days, it's higher, and then it goes back to normal. It is uh, prolonged hypertension. Uh, the concern is that ultimately it can lead to heart failure, it can lead to vascular disease, it can lead to renal failure, it can lead to stroke. So there's so many complications that can arise from it. That's why it's important to monitor it. And also, so that's why if you're in that, that pre-hypertension uh, area, you want to be careful and perhaps just start making some lifestyle changes so that it comes back down so that later in life it does not develop into hypertension, which they can then develop these these other complications. With hypertension or the high blood pressure, the heart's having to work harder. That's hard on it. Um, and it can also have an increase in the plaque buildup. 90% of hypertensive conditions are primary hypertensive. There's not one specific underlying cause. There are risk factors that may put you in a higher category of developing this later, things such as genetics, diet, obesity, age, if you have diabetes, smoking, um, it can be controlled. There's no cure for it. Some things that you can do to help try to control it is restrict your salt intake, restrict fat intake, cholesterol intake, try to increase your exercise if you're overweight, you're going to lose some weight, if you're a smoker stop smoking. And if those lifestyle changes don't work, there are uh, drugs that you can take to help lower. Secondary hypertension is less common. It's usually due to um, a disorder that you can actually put your finger on, such as maybe kidney disease or endocrine disorder. And so the treatment then is treating what the underlying problem is that's causing the high blood pressure. Hypotension is low blood pressure. It's when it's below 90 over 60. Um, sometimes athletes typically will have a lower than normal blood pressure. So oftentimes they'll be um, fine. The thing you would be concerned is if there's not enough blood flow to the tissues. That's where there, there could be a concern. Typically people who have hypotension are usually associated, I mean, it, as long as the tissues are getting enough blood flow, it's usually not a problem. It tends to be associated with long life and lack of cardiovascular illness. Sometimes there can be what we call orthostatic hypertension. This is just temporary low blood pressure. You might feel a little bit dizzy when you are changing your, your posture, changing from, say, uh, sitting or you're lying down, and you suddenly stand up. That sudden change can have a temporary drop in blood pressure and, and you'll feel dizzy. Chronic hypotension uh, 
sometimes it can be a warning of nutrition, maybe poor nutrition, um, and certainly acute hypertension, sudden very low drop in the blood pressure, it could be a sign that you're entering into a circle. What happens with shock is the blood vessels, um, they're not circulating blood normally, they're not filling properly. Uh, basically, the flow is not meeting what the demand of the tissue is. Hypovolumetric shock is when you've had a large amount of blood loss, and that triggers the pressure to drop. Vascular shock is when you have extreme dilation, so the, the diameter of those blood vessels has increased, and it means decreased resistance, and that's vascular shock. Uh, when the heart's working inefficiently and it cannot sustain adequate circulation, that's cardiogenic shock. In controlling the blood flow, tissue perfusion is referring to the blood flow that's going through the body tissues. And what is so important about this? Well, it's delivering oxygen, it's delivering nutrients to the cells of the tissues, and it's removing the waste products. In the lungs, you're talking about gas exchange, digestive tract, you've got absorption of the nutrients, and in the kidneys, you have the formation of urine. The rate, the rate of the flow is very closely regulated so that you're getting the most efficient functioning of that particular tissue. There's extrinsic and intrinsic factors that are going to play a role in that rate of the blood flow. The sympathetic nervous system is going to be involved with extrinsic as well as hormones um, and the effect that they are playing on Intrinsic, it's also known as autoregulation, where the blood flow is going to be adjusted locally in, in that tissue. It's going to be the local arterioles that will um, adjust their diameters and how much blood flow is feeding into the capillary beds. So an example of this is during exercise. At rest, your skeletal muscles receive about 20% of the total blood, but during exercise, it's going to increase to over 70%. And so the intrinsic controls, what they do is those arterioles are going to dilate to allow increased blood flow coming into the capillary beds and the muscles. The muscles, as you know from muscle contraction, are going to require additional oxygen so they can produce the ATP for the muscle contraction to occur. The intrinsic control is going to decrease blood flow to other organs. If you're exercising, well, you don't need as much blood going to the kidney taking urine. You don't need as much blood going to the digestive organs. You need to focus it on the skeleton. You don't stop the blood flow completely to those other organs, but you can decrease the amount of flow where it needs to go. The total uh, blood flow, the rate is going to increase, but obviously the total volume remains the same. With autoregulation, some of these intrinsic conditions, uh, reactive hyperemia is when you have increased blood flow to an area due to these intrinsic factors. Can be metabolic controls or myogenic controls. Metabolic controls. This is where uh, you have increase in the metabolic activity in the tissue. Uh, because of this increased metabolic activity, the level of oxygen in those tissues starts to decrease. And you have an increase because of the metabolic activity of the products. Um, you tend to see an increase in hydrogen ions and increase, which is going to lower the pH. You have an increase in potassium, adenosine, and other products as well. What's going to happen is this causes a relaxation in the arterioles, causes this, those precapillary sphincters to relax, which is going to increase the amount of blood flow coming in. Uh, inflammatory chemicals that may be released um, as part of the inflammatory response relative to infection and injury, those can also cause vasodilation as well.
myogenic controls. The vascular uh, smooth tissue responds to the mean arterial pressure. Uh, there's what we call passive stretch and reduced stretch. The passive stretch is when there is uh, the vessel wall stretches more than normal. And reduced stretch is when uh, the decreased arterial pressure causes less stretch than normal. Long-term autoregulation is going to occur when the short-term autoregulation cannot meet all of the requirements of the tissue for nutrients. Um, and as the name implies, long-term, it may take a long time for ultimately uh, the blood supply to increase to that tissue area. The number of vessels to the area is going to increase, and the existing vessels, they tend to enlarge in size. This happens sometimes we see the heart when one vessel, one of the coronary vessels, is blocked. Um, we tend to see this in people who live at high altitude where there's less oxygen. It's one of the adjustments that the body makes to meet the tissue and what their oxygen and metabolic needs are. <coughs> this table is just showing um, with the arterial with the smooth muscle, some of the controls, intrinsic and extrinsic. Bottom line is what is triggering them to dilate or constrict? When they dilate, you're going to have increased blood flow, decreased blood pressure. When they constrict, you have decreased flow, but increased pressure. Blood flow in certain uh, areas, we've got the skeletal muscles, I say, depending on exercise activity, there will be a change in the amount of flow of blood <coughs> to the area at rest. Um, the flow is at about one liter per minute, and this can increase uh, 10 times higher than that during exercise. It has to basically think of supply and demand. As the demand for oxygen, etc., increases, then you've got to increase that supply of oxygen so that you get the proper, in this case with skeletal muscles, you get the proper contraction that, that's needed. In the brain, you've got to have good blood flow um, to the brain. It must be constant because the neurons cannot handle changes in the uh, flow rate. So if there is a decrease in pH or an increase in carbon dioxide, that is going to trigger dilation of the blood vessels. <coughs> so there's different control mechanisms. Uh, a decreased uh, mean arterial pressure will cause the vessels to dilate. An increase in that arterial pressure causes the vessels to constrict. Uh, so the brain is very fragile in terms of it's very susceptible to extreme changes. So you don't want to have these uh, extreme changes. You want to keep it relatively evil. Um, if the pressure drops too low, you can have a case of where the person will faint. If the pressure goes too high, then it can uh, result in excess swelling and fluid retention and In the skin, the function of the blood flow through the skin is helping to provide nutrients to the, all the cells. It's going to also help regulate body temperature. That's one of the functions of the skin. The blood is carrying uh, heat with it, so as it comes near the surface, it can uh, release that excess heat, which is why if someone's overheated, especially if they're fair skin, you may see them turning red in color flush. Why? Because you have increased blood flow so that it's releasing that heat to try to cool down. If you're cold, you often look more pale because uh, the blood vessels right along the surface, the superficial ones, tend to constrict to reduce the amount of blood flow on the surface to try to retain the heat. It also, uh, skin is considered as a blood reservoir and that's going to be controlled So I said the um, blood that's flowing just below the skin helps to regulate that body temperature. 
And it can, as you can see, uh, vary the rate of flow tremendously, anywhere from 50 milliliters per minute to 250 milliliters per minute. And it's going to be controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And as I said, uh, just a bit ago, as the temperature rises, you're going to cause dilation, that increased blood flow into the capillary beds to release that heat. And the reverse is true um, when the lungs, uh, the pulmonary circuit is, is very short. And what's going to happen is that what we see, the, the arteries and the arterioles, the walls are a little bit thinner than what you'd see elsewhere in the body. The pressure is lower. Uh, the pathway is very, very short. Um, low oxygen levels are going to cause vasoconstriction. High levels of oxygen are going to promote vasodilation. So it's reverse what you see elsewhere. It's allowing the blood to flow um, to the oxygen rich for the heart the blood flow through the heart it's influenced by the uh, pressure in the aorta and how well the uh, ventricles are pumping uh, during uh, the diastolic stage relaxation the uh, pressure in the aorta is very high, and that's going to help force the blood through the coronary circulation, that circulation of the heart muscle itself. At rest, the, the flow is about 250 milliliters per minute. Um, during strenuous exercise, the coronary vessels are going to dilate um, so that the blood flow is going to increase. And that's really important because those cardiac muscle cells need a lot of oxygen. The velocity of the blood flow is going to uh, vary as it travels through your systemic circulation. It's fastest in the aorta, very slow in the capillaries, and then it's going to increase again in the veins. Um, the capillaries have the largest total area, and so the flow is the slowest then. And you want it to be slow because then that allows enough time as the blood's flowing through there for that exchange of gas, nutrients, and waste to occur. So as it enters the capillary bed, the blood uh, the enters it, it's moving slow. You can have the oxygen leave the blood, go into the interstitial fluid. The nutrients leave the blood, go into the interstitial fluid. And by the time it continues to travel through that capillary bed and gets towards the end right before it, attaches to the venule, it is taking up the carbon dioxide waste product and other waste products. So this is showing uh, the velocity as compared to a cross-section of the vessels and what that relative cross-section is. Vasomotion is intermittent flow of blood through the capillaries, and this is due to those precapillary sphincters, whether they are opening or closed. <coughs> this allows for the diffusion of the molecules to occur between the blood and the interstitial fluid. Things are going to move from higher concentration to lower concentration. That's what we mean when we say it's going to move down its concentration gradient. So some molecules may be diffused directly across the membrane. Some are going to move through cloughs. Some are going to move through those uh, fenestrations. And some things are going to move by active transport, by uh, penocytotic vesicles. Uh, some of your larger molecules have to move. So this is a cross-section of capillary. And it is showing, as you can see, the cleft, the opening, the pores or the fenestrations. Um, you can see where there are those vesicles, the penocytotic vesicles that will move larger molecules out. And this is um, an enlarged picture showing, number one, the diffusion, things moving from high to low concentration, typically your lipid-soluble substances. Two, we're showing the movement through those clefts. Those tend to be water-soluble substances. 
Three is the movement through the fenestrations. These also tend to be your water-soluble substances. Uh, the fenestrations, think of those as those little pores or holes. And then number four is the transport uh, by the vesicles. And these would be larger substances that could not easily move through the fenestrations or So as I said a bit ago, the fluid's going to be forced out of the cloths at the capillaries at the arterial end and then returned at the venous end. Um, you have this, this mixing uh, between the plasma and the interstitial fluid that's going to help maintain that interstitial environment. Things will move depending on hydrostatic pressure and also on osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is that force that's exerted by the fluid as it's pushed against the wall. You have the capillary and you have the interstitial uh, pressure. The colloid osmotic pressure, once again, in the capillary and also in the interstitial, um, the way it's like the capillary osmotic pressure, it's almost like it's, it's sucking um, things that no normally will not diffuse. Um, they're being back in. <coughs> so you can look at the uh, formulas if you wish um, to calculate what these pressures are typically what we talk about the, the net fluid flow out at the arterial end is referred to as filtration it's moving out of the blood and then at the venous end reabsorption is the movement back into the blood more fluid tends to leave by filtration, so at the arterial end, than what is reabsorbed at the venous end, which means if this is happening all the time, you're increasing the amount of fluid in that interstitial area. That interstitial fluid level of volume is increasing if more fluid is coming out of the blood than what's returned to it. So how are you going to deal with that? If you don't, you're going to have swelling in that area. So the excess interstitial fluid is returned to the blood eventually by the lymphatic system. And so in this uh, drawing, you see the blood's coming down the arteriole. Some of it's passing into this capillary bed, not all of it, because the arteriole continues on. There's multiple capillary beds attached to it. So as it comes in, uh, it's flowing through the arterial and you've got uh, substances leaving the blood. So it's flowing out into that interstitial space. But by the time you reach at the venule end of the capillary bed, it's flowing back in the, the reabsorption. So filtration at the front part and then at the end it's reabsorption. But as I said, more leaves and it's returned to the blood, which is ultimately then going to flow into the venule, to the veins, back to the heart. That green structure you see at the bottom right is uh, a lymphatic capillary, and this is what's going to help reabsorb that excess fluid and ultimately return it back to the blood. So the bulk flow, like I say, its uh, movement is driven by hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Uh, <coughs> and this is in a nutshell, pretty much saying hydrostatic pressure is going to kind of push substances across. Osmotic pressure is sucking it. And this is actually looking at the level of the pressures. Uh, like I said, we can measure them um, as you're, you have this mixing occurring between the plasma and the interstitial fluid. And once again, the net reabsorption that's occurring at the venous end previous was the filtration at the um, arterial end of the capillary bed. Edema is abnormal increase in the amount of interstitial fluid. Uh, swelling is what most of you are used to seeing it. Um, it, there can be several different causes. There may be an increase in the outward pressure, so it's driving fluid out of the capillaries, or there's a decrease in the inward pressure. Um, it can 
like I say, have multiple causes. You may have problems with venous valves. You may have a blockage. You may have congestive heart failure, high blood volume. <coughs> An increase in the interstitial fluid pressure, osmotic pressure, can result from the inflammatory response. Uh, the inflammatory response tends to increase permeability in the capillaries. The idea is to get more macrophages to the area to try to combat an infection and prevent uh, spread of an infection. A decrease in capillary colloid osmotic pressure tends to decrease the amount of fluid returning to the blood. This sometimes is seen with things such as malnutrition, liver disease, or type I said you can also have problems where with edema being caused by decreased drainage of that interstitial fluid. Maybe the lymphatic vessels have been blocked uh, by disease or maybe they have been surgically removed, uh, often as a response to the disease or conditions such as cancer. If you have this excess fluid, you have this edema, the swelling, this is putting extra pressure on the tissue. It may impair the function of the tissue um, because with the excess fluid, gas, and nutrients you now have to travel further to get to the cells. Um, and so <coughs> there may be compensations that have to be made due to this. This is a a picture showing what we call the edema. You can uh, certainly tell that this foot is swollen and you press on it and see how it responds. So with the vascular system, remember there's two circulation uh, pathways. You have the pulmonary circulation, which is just going from the heart to the lungs back to the heart, and then the systemic circulation, which is servicing the rest of the body. And as you've seen previously uh, in this diagram, this flow chart of how the blood is coming from the systemic circulation goes to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary circulation, to both of the lungs. You have the gas exchange, it drops off the CO2, loads up on oxygen, returns to the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then to the systemic circulation where it's going to go around and then return to the right side of the heart. And in this illustration, you're seeing the, um, in this case, the pulmonary arterial system is shown in blue. And the reason for that is because it is low in oxygen. And then the venous system is shown in red because it's oxygen rich. And this is showing for the systemic circulation how the blood is uh, path that way that it's following in the circulation. Uh, from the order, you do have several branches, such as the common carotid that's going to have arteries going up to the head, the subclavian arteries go to the upper limbs, and then the aortic arch, so that it now descends, goes through the thoracic area, and you have branches that, that will branch off, and then it will pass through the uh, diaphragm, below the diaphragm, we refer to it as abdominal aorta, and then you continue to have branching off as it services or supplies the various organs in the abdominal pelvic areas and finally down to the lower limbs and then back up. And as you can see, the inferior vena cava is returning blood from uh, below the diaphragm to the right atrium. Superior vena cava is uh, supplying the or returning blood from the head, the upper limbs, and above the diaphragm back to the heart. Arteries tend to run very deep. The veins tend to be both deep and superficial. Um, if the vein is deep, it tends to have the same name as the corresponding artery. Superficial veins, uh, their names they don't correspond to an artery. The venous pathways are more interconnected. Um, often veins can have more than one name, which sometimes makes it confusing, especially for you students trying to learn the names. The brain and the digestive systems do have unique drainage systems. 
The brain contains what we call dural venous sinuses in the digestive system. Uh, what's going to happen is the veins are going to drain into the hepatic portal system, which is then going to go through the liver before it returns to the heart. And part of the reason for that is because the liver does act as a filter.